reading from uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been, it had, I had not been set in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, If it pleases the king and, I, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, How long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me the timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans Euphrates and gave him the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanibal the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began the good work. But when Sanibal the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Taras. Hey, we want to take just a moment. And this, this past Wednesday night, we were here and we did Facebook Live right here in the chapel. I don't know if any of you got to see that. But we invite you back. If you want to come on a Wednesday night, we're going to be doing Facebook Live right here. We'd love to have you kind of root us on, you know. I do better preaching to people than an empty room. Amen. But then I went home and I turned on the news. And as I watched the news, literally, I just had tears in my eyes as I identified what was happening um, in Louisville. And two police officers were just shot. I mean, they, they just went to work. Right? They just went to work. They were just um, doing their job. Uh, they were men, people. They were just people who had a job. Anybody here, do you have a job? You have, you know, you're a people and you have a job? They were just like you. And they went to work one day and somebody just started shooting at them. And because they represented the police across our country, and I couldn't help but um, four police officers that uh, are in our church, I texted them. And Taras was one of them. He's a Newark police officer. And so I wanted to ask Taras to come this morning also as a representative of the police in our community, in our state, and our nation, 
And I just, I texted them right away and told them, my, my heart is with you. I pray for these men, Anthony Prey, Bernard, who was formerly a police officer, Jonathan Costa, right? These men that have been in our church and, and serve our community, amen? And as you can see, he's just, he's a guy, just like, just like we are, amen? He's a human being, and we are so thankful for the protection that our police provide. Amen? Yeah. So would you join me as I just pray? Lord God, I just thank you. I thank you for the men and women who have the courage to put on a uniform and to bring, just to do their best to establish law and order and justice and uphold the laws and things that they are asked to do. And they put themselves in harm's way many times doing this, Lord God. And I pray that you would put a, a sovereign hand of protection upon them, upon Taras, upon Anthony, upon Jonathan, Father, any of the other law enforcement officers that have come here, that come to this church, but also, Lord, we know that they are representative of police in this city, at the university, uh, in this state, throughout the county, and across the United States. And Lord, we know that, they, that police officers are many times put in very difficult positions, and um, what, what happens um, in conflict takes an immense amount of training, an immense amount of patience, uh, and, and, they, and they're called upon to do things that are that, to make really tough decisions. And sometimes they don't get it right. And for that, Lord, we apologize. And, and we confess that, Lord, as, as any police officer would, that we don't always get it right. But they do their best. And they, they protect us. And we are thankful for them. And Lord, as I was taught from a young child that we should respect those in authority. And 1 Corinthians, in Romans chapter 13, makes it crystal clear that if we respect authority, it reveals our respect for God. And if we resist that authority, we disrespect God. And so we ask, Lord, give us a deep respect in our heart for those in authority. And we pray this, do it deep within us, in Jesus Christ's most holy name, amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Amen. So we're, we've got a lot to say today, and I believe we've got a, really a message that is really important for our heart. And as we've been speaking about, we see a tremendous parallel between what was happening in the book of Nehemiah and what is happening in America today, what is happening in our church and churches all across our nation, right? And as soon as, as, soon as Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, came, in verse 3 of chapter 1, and, you know, Nehemiah said to him, how are things in Judah, the southern kingdom, where Jerusalem is, the, the city of our God? Can you say the city of our God? How are things in the city of our God? And they said, the walls are broken down. The gates are burning. It is on fire, right? And the people are in great distress. And in verse 4, immediately Nehemiah falls on his knees and, and he, he weeps before God. And this was in the month of Chislu, right? And so, you know, we don't know until you get to chapter 2, right, that he begins to speak again. And it was the month of Nisan. And in the month of Nisan, this is four months later, right? So you don't realize that when you're reading chapter one, but this was four months of fasting and prayer. Can you say four months of fasting and prayer? Four months. He fell down on his face before God, and he, began, he took responsibility. And in his head, in his head, he knew what he needed to do. The first thought in Nehemiah's heart is, man, I need to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild those city walls. It breaks my heart that my people in the city of God are in great distress. Somebody has to do something about this, right? But you know what? Not yet. Can you say not yet? 
Oh, it was in his head. He knew what he needed to do, but can you say it? Not yet. Not yet. And so I just want to just take a minute and just kind of recap and just going to have a little fun. We have a lot of words today that start with the letter P, right? And so the first thing that Nehemiah did was he prayed, right? He had to pray to God and get permission, second P, pray, and then he had to get permission from God. And then he went before the king and his countenance was sad. Now this is four months of fasting and prayer. And he had to get permission from the king because he was under the king's authority, right? And when the king asked him what he wanted to do, he boldly proclaimed. Can you say proclaimed? He, he boldly proclaimed and he asked for protection and provision. He asked that the king would send soldiers, right, to protect him as he went, right? And as he went, he asked for provision. He was very bold. He asked for provision because he needed to rebuild gates. We have a gate that'll be used next week, right? We have some gates that are going to be built, and you'll see those next week because all the gates, right, all the city gates were torn down. The walls were down, but the gates were down, and you could rebuild the stone, but if you didn't rebuild the gates and put locks and hinges on the gates, then the city could still not be protected, right? Are, are you seeing this, right? So, so Nehemiah, as soon as he hears it from his brother Hanani in chapter 1 and verse 3, he knew what he needed to do, but it was not yet, not yet, not, you can't go now. And it was a space of four months that he fasted and prayed. And after four months, he was sad one day in the king's court, right, which was actually against the law. You couldn't be sad in the king's court because, because maybe it meant you were mad at the king and you would kill the king. And that's why he said, let the king live forever. I, I'm not against you, king. I'm for you. But how can I not be sad when I consider my people, the people of God in the city of God, and what's going on there? They're in great distress, and the walls are broken down, and the, the gates are burning with fire. Something must be done. Could you help me? Would you send me? Would you let me go and rebuild the walls? He asked the king for permission. He asked for protection for soldiers to go with him because as he would go, he would go through enemy territory, right? And there would be enemies that would try to stop him, right? And he asked for provision so that he could have wood to rebuild uh, the city gates, right? And then all of this, as it came together, it would need people, we'll come back to that, people to be behind it, right? And that would be the proof. It would be the proof that God was in it. See, sometimes we have to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, right? First Thessalonians 5.17, can you say amen? Amen? Hey, if you're listening online, send me a chat just say amen. Sometimes we need proof that God is working in our midst. And, and you see God start to bring protection and provision and people, and it serves as proof that God is in what we're doing. Amen? And then at this time, the final P is Nehemiah didn't tell anybody. As the king sent him, he didn't tell anybody yet what was in his heart. You see, this four-month period of prayer and fasting and waiting on God was an opportunity for God to take the vision that was in his head and drive it down into his heart, right? So it wasn't just like, hey, this is a good thing. It'd be great to, yeah, that'd be great. Let's do it. Yeah, that'd be a nice thing to do. No, this must be done. We cannot fail. We must succeed. We must go back and rebuild the walls. Amen? Now, I just want you to see one, one more thing as, as we look at this chapter, and, and then I'm going to preach. Do you mind if I preach? Okay. So the first thing is verse 17. 
He goes, he surveys the walls, he walks around, right? He's on his animal, he get, goes around, he's got a couple guys with him. I bet they were warriors, I bet they were protectors, right? And he went at night, thus the black tapestry here, right? And, and he went at night and he began to survey the city walls, right? And as he surveyed and walked around those walls, right? He was really coming up with a strategy and a plan to execute the vision that God laid in his heart. Are you with me? Okay. And, and then he addressed the people, okay? And he said, hey, I have a vision. Verse 17, come, let us rebuild the wall, right? He said, come, Come on, let's come together, let's rebuild the wall. And as he addressed the people, in verse 18, you know what the people said? It, notice what it says. It says, and they said, can you say they said? The people agreed. They got agreement. Nehemiah cast vision. He said, hey, this is the vision. Come let us rebuild the wall. And the people said, they said, let us rise up and build right? In other words, he got buy-in from the people. He said, hey, this is what we want to do. We want to revitalize. And the people said, let's do it. What do you need me to do? Amen? That's a good thing, isn't it? And then notice in verse 20, and he told them what was in his heart, and he told them how God had worked, how he had provided. He showed them the proof of it. And then he said, therefore, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. We will do it together, right? Nehemiah had a vision. The people agreed. They had buy-in. They said, let's do it. And then they said, let's go do it. Can you say together? Can you send me a chat this morning and just say together? This is something we're going to do together. Amen? Now, last week, we started this series off talking about some resolving some unfinished spiritual business, right? And, and that was a little painful. We talked about some things and, and why, you know, just like Nehemiah did, you have to ask, why are these walls broken down? Why, why are we in this condition? And while it is a little painful to talk about why are we here, how did we get here, you know what? It's also very profitable because you know what happens? That builds in us a deep resolve that we don't want to go back there again. Can you send me an amen? Right? Isn't it true? Like when, when you hear the stories, when you see the artifacts of the broken down walls, when you hear the stories, when you hear the folklore of what happened, it's painful but it builds a resolve within our heart that we don't want to go back there again. And if you look around, you say, and I certainly don't want to stay here. We can't leave these walls down. We can't leave the gates unfinished. We must go forward. I'm sorry, let me, let me try that again. Terry, can you help me this morning? Hey, we can't, we don't want to go back. We can't stay here, right? We've got to go forward. We've got to go forward. We've got to go from here to there. We don't want to stay here. We want to go forward. Amen? Amen? And, you know, outwardly the walls were torn down and the gates were burning, but inwardly there was, an, there was a moral decay and there was apathy. Apathy? What is that? I don't care. It's not, it's, it's nothing. I, what are we going to do about it? Do you ever feel like that? I, I don't like the way things are, right? But I don't know what to do, right? And that's when, that's this time of struggle. See, Nehemiah was in that time. In his heart, he, he wanted to immediately like as soon as he heard the walls were torn down, he wanted to jump up and run there. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? Like when you're young, that's what you do, right? You hear about a problem, you just run at it, you know? And sometimes you make the problem worse. Sometimes you just have to wait. And you're in that place 
where God is forcing the vision that is in your head down into your heart and he's building your resolve to do what you need to do, right? But it's important to define reality. That's what leaders do, right? Is defining reality, this is the way things are, is a responsibility that leaders must do. I think we have a slide up there for that, right? And, you know, understanding the answers to those questions, how did we get here? What happened, right? It creates dissatisfaction in our heart, right? But hopefully it gives definition that builds in us a determination to never allow it to happen Again, what am I talking about? I'm talking about resolving some unfinished spiritual business, right? And and once we say, hey, yes, uh, Numbers 26, Deuteronomy 28, we violated your statutes, we violated your commands, and that's why we're here. And Nehemiah took responsibility, confessed the sins of the people. And he said, but this is where we are. And he defined reality and he spoke it. And it created dissatisfaction within the people's hearts. But it it built in them a determination that I don't want to stay there. I don't want to go back there. I don't want to stay here. We must go forward. And that took took four months, right? And by the way, it was a time of fasting and prayer. By the way, thank you for anybody that joined this week. We had six prayer meetings uh, on Zoom. We prayed at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. for three days. And and there were several people that fasted. Thank you for joining us in that. And it was, I believe, was a profitable time. I sensed the presence of God. I sensed the power of God. And and we're going to do it again. It's going to be something we're going to do again on a regular basis. We'll let you know. Get Prepare your heart. We're going to be doing some more fasting and prayer over the next four months, right? We're going to fast. We're going to pray. It's not going to be for four months. Can someone say amen? See, that's an opportunity. I would have been, if I was out there, I'd have said amen. (laughs) You know, I don't want to fast for four months. Three days, three days is a challenge. I don't even like missing a meal. Amen? But sometimes it's necessary, right? So four months of intense prayer and fasting, rumination, internal consternation and struggle. Who likes struggle? Who likes, have you ever been in a place, oh, should I quit this job? Should I move? Should I, you ever have any of that? This is hard. I'm not, something's going on inside me in my head. I say, I need to do this, but I'm not ready. It's not the right time. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had a struggle? Have you ever been in a time of struggle and you were wrestling with it? Yeah, we all have. That's how God works. God uses those times to take you from crises to process. God is working. He uses crises and he takes us through a process. And it's in those times our resolve is strengthened, right? And Nehemiah, you know, was called to revitalize, to rebuild, to revive the people of God. And it doesn't happen overnight. It does not happen overnight, right? In the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, we see that there was this whole process. When you get to Nehemiah chapter eight, you know what you're gonna find out? 15 years, Ezra was teaching the word of God to the people to revitalize their hearts. Because you know what? You can rebuild the walls, that's easy. Hey, get the men together. We can rebuild these city walls. Get the families together. We can rebuild the gates. But something's got to happen in the heart that only happens through fasting and prayer and studying the word of God. God's got to revitalize the heart, right? God had to do a deep, renewing work within the hearts of the people to prepare them to prepare them to be motivated to go back, right? And 
you know, they understood what God wanted to do for them. He wanted them to go back. God wanted, this is the vision, God wanted his people to come out of exile. 70 years they were taken into captivity. 70 years they were taken away from the city of God, from the people of God were taken out of the city of God, and they were held in captivity to Babylon, which was taken over by the Medes and the Persians, right? And these people are exiled. Many of them died. Now there's a new generation. They've only heard rumors about how great the city of God was, the temple of God, and all that God had done for his people. They had, they had a vast history of what God had done for them throughout the history of Israel. The walls of Jericho came down. They, God parted the Red Sea. He parted the Jordan River. Right, God did all these great things for his people. They, they walked through the wilderness, and for 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out. Right, like God just did all these great things. They have this rich heritage, but they turned away from God. And so now they're here. And so God wants to bring them back. So it's easy to come back and rebuild the walls, but the deeper work is what God wants to do inside their hearts right? And, you know, sometimes you just got to start by doing something. And that's what really the walls were all about. Like, we, you've heard us say before, God doesn't steer parked cars, right? You know, you ever get in your car and, and you think, you know, today cars are so quiet, you start it up and you can't even hear it running. And sometimes you forget to start it up and it's, oh, the steering wheel's locked. You can't steer it, it's just parked. It's not, you can't turn the wheel, right? You've got to start it and start going, and then it's so easy to turn the wheel. And the same is true with us. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to get going. You've got, to, you've got to get in the way. Hello? Where's Pastor Ron? Pastor Ron, say, you've got to get in the way. Sometimes, Pastor Boone, isn't it true? you just got to get in the way. You've got to get in the way, and then God starts moving. They had to go back and start to rebuild, and that was part of the process to get them moving. That's why he said, come, let us rebuild the wall, right? Let us build up the wall. Let us rise and build, right? So here, the parallel with us, right? It's not about walls. We, we built these walls, right? We, we have some special music, right? We, we had the drama team here last week doing, doing their skits. That, it's, that's a means to an end. Sometimes you just got to get things moving. You got to get people in their cars and, and let's start moving with God. Let's be available to him. But the real, the real work that God wants to do here in our hearts, that revitalizing work that God needs to do in us is he, he wants to cultivate a desire to reach beyond the walls of our church into the neighborhoods that are around us, to the people that we know around the city. It's not about just what's happening within the walls. It's going beyond the walls and reaching out into a community and a culture that we live in today that's deeply divided. But that's only going to happen through fasting and prayer and the word of God. Right? So, and and it's gotta, there's got to be a deep resolve and there's going to be a struggle. We've got to determine, we've got to count the cost and say, are we, willing, are we willing to be a church that will revitalize to reach out beyond our walls? Or we can just huddle with a, with a dwindling number of people and huddle together and try and encourage one another right, and hold on to what we've got, or we can lift up our eyes like John chapter 4, and we can look out and say, oh, this world, uh, this world around us needs something that they don't have to change the world in which we live, right? And I believe, this is, this is my paradigm, this is what I really believe, and in talking to people, if you were to ask any group of people, and look out and talk to people in this world and say, you know, are, are you content with the way things are in the world around you today? I, hello, 
I would venture to guess 95% of people, probably more than that, they may disagree on what's wrong with the world. But I bet more than not, I, I, do you think there's 5% of people say, hey, everything's great. We love it the way things are. You know, I love being home on quarantine. No, most people agree that, that things need to change. The way things are is not the way that God would want them to be, right? And can you say it with me again? You know, we, we can't go back. We don't want to stay here. We must go forward. Can we agree on that? Like, we've got to go forward. We've got to do something different, right? Now, how many believe, how many believe that the government has the answers to solve the problems that we're facing today in the world? If you do, you have much more faith in government than I do. I don't have faith that our government is going to fix the problems that we're facing today. And I, I, you know, forget elections. I, I don't believe it's the role of government is ever to do that. It takes the people of God to rise up at a grassroots level. Listen, what happens in the culture around us, right, is a result. Like God gives us leaders. God gives us people that represent the people and the heart of the people, right? That's what God does. And so God is working in this nation and he's bringing people to their knees. This is a time for the people of God to cry out and to have this struggle in your heart and say, we can't go back. We can't stay here. We must go forward. Amen? And that's, that's where the people of God come in, right? Is, is, you know, is we have a mission. And our mission is we help people know Jesus personally and serve him passionately. That's, that's what we do as the people of God. We help people know Jesus personally and serve him passionately, right? And, and we have to chart a course of what needs to happen, right? Because as we process through all these things, right, the possibilities for the future vision is taking shape in our heart as you wrestle, as you wake up. I don't know if any of you ever wake up in the night and you think about it. And you're thinking, you wake up and your mind is just spinning. You think, man, it, something's not right. We got we to gotta do something different. We can't go back. We can't stay here. We've got to go forward. And, and your mind is spinning and you begin working on it and charting a course. And I don't know if any of you ever, ever use, you know, in fact, my iPhone is down there, but I fill up my notes, right? I, sometimes in the night, you know, I, I pull, I wake up and I can't sleep and I start thinking of stuff and I just, we got to do this and we got to do this. And God starts speaking to me and I'm ruminating and there's a struggle. And you know what? I can't get out of bed and call up and say, hey, Marie and Trish, I want to have a meeting right now. We, we need to do some things. Dave and Sheila, we, we got to get some things done. Hey, Lydia, we, we get, you know, like, you, no, you can't do that. It's, it's just something that I have to struggle with. You struggle with right? And we let God work deep in us. And when he's, what he's doing, he's taking the vision in our head, what we know is right in our head, and he's driving it deep into our heart so that we have a deep resolve. Because it's in our heart, that's where our, our determination is. When you really say, this isn't just something that we should do, it's something we must do. We have to do. We can't fail. That's where our resolve is. That's where our determination is, right? Are you with me this morning? And that's when vision becomes very powerful because it's not enough for a vision just to be in the head. It's got to be in the heart, right? That's where our passion is, right? And the vision translates from the head into the heart. And that's the difference between knowing what we should do and knowing what we must do, what we have to do. Amen? See, in the heart, in the heart, we say, this must be done. We must do this. I will do my part. I can't do everything, but we must do it together. 
Amen? And that's what God was doing. That's what chapter two is all about, is Nehemiah had to wait four months praying, fasting, struggling, waiting, self-control. Oh, I bet he just wanted to run back there today and just start building. He couldn't do it because he couldn't do it by himself. He needed people, right? He, he needed people around him. It had to be a team effort. There had to be buy-in. There had to be agreement, right? They had to determine to do it together. They had to have a plan, right? Because you, couldn't go, you can't just go off half-baked, right? There were enemies. There were people that were going to stand against them. See, in every great story, there has to be a villain, Right? In this story, it's Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Right? And, and they're introduced here in chapter two, but we're not going to talk about them today. Let's just, let's just say there were enemies. And they were determined to thwart the efforts of Nehemiah. They felt threatened. They, they liked the way that things were. They liked the walls torn down. They liked the gates there. They could go in and steal and rob and pilfer and do anything they want. They had their way. But Nehemiah determined in his heart there has to be a change. And some people are great. When they hear the vision, their heart is caught up. But there are other people, part of their design is they say, it's great to have a vision, but what's the plan? Tell me the strategy. I need to know the details. I need to know how many. I need to know who. I need to know how. I need to know when. I, I need facts and figures, and all those things are in the head, and it's great. You need those things, but it's the heart that gives us the determination to know that this must happen. But that doesn't mean you don't have a plan. You still have to have a plan and a strategy, and there's a difference. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, next week, right? And then you had to have a provision, Right? He could go back and have the best of intentions, but if he didn't have those cedars, if he didn't have that wood that was provided by the king and the soldiers to carry him and help him transport, then they're just not going to rebuild the gates. The wood was all burned down. Right, The gates were already burned. There was no wood. If you're in the desert, there's no wood. So they had to go and they had to get the wood first. There had to be a provision. And the king said, yes, I'll give you protection and you can go and cut down the wood and we'll send armies of people to help you bring that wood back to Jerusalem so that you can rebuild those city gates. They had to have power. There had to be power. Power comes from from reading and studying the word of God, but also from prayer and sometimes from fasting. Remember what we taught last week, Matthew chapter 17? This kind comes out only through prayer and fasting. See, there's some things that man can do, and then there's other things that only God can do. And I believe that we're in a time now where our back is up against the wall and it has to be God. And God has to move the people of God to do what only he can do. That's the essence of prayer. You see, when, when, it, when everything else fails, people turn to prayer. I remember years ago, we, had, uh, we were in Tacoma and we had the... Um, the, the ships would come into Tacoma and they would offload, offload their, their ships in the port of Tacoma. And we had a little Bible study. Somebody met somebody that met somebody and they asked us to come down and do a Bible study down at the port when the men came in from sea and, and one boat came from China. And there, we had a whole group, about 10 or 15 guys from China. And we had a Chinese translator and, and we had a Bible study and we were talking and, and um the, the captain of the ship was there, and we didn't really know who they were. We, I was just a Bible college student, and he said something very profound. He said he was a Christian man, and he had encouraged all his guys on his ship to come to this Bible study and to come to the church. And we were talking, and this thing came, and they translated, and it was profound, so much so that like 30 years, this was like 30 years ago, Right, I remember a Bible study, what was said. And, and the, the captain in, in Chinese said it, and it was translated. He said, many times when we're on the, on the sea, it gets very rough. 
But there's sometimes the sea gets so rough that you, you think that you might lose your life. And people have all different types of religions and they, they have their, you know, their uh, idols out and they have their statues and they have their prayer beads and they have all these different things that they rely on and they confess that they believe in. He says, but what I've seen as a captain of a ship for over 30 years, when you think the ship is going down, that's when people really fall on their knees and cry out to the one true God. When they know the ship is going down, like then they call out on the one, all them prayer beads and all that other stuff goes. They call out on the one true God. And you know what? That's where our power comes from, right? Can, can you say that? Can you send me a chat? That's where our power comes from, prayer and fasting, amen? And then, and then the last one here, purpose. This is really important. When you take on something really tough, like Nehemiah going back and rebuilding the city walls, that is really tough, right? He had opposition from the Arabians and you know, the different ones, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, right? They were gathering together. They, there was big opposition. And when you have big opposition, you have to understand your purpose. That is the why. Why are we doing this, right? We're doing it for our God and for his people. We're doing it for our children and our children's children and the children that will come after them. We are doing it for the children of the families that live in our community. We are doing it for those that passed before us generations and generations ago who believed in a dream that is called America. And we have that dream in our heart, right? We're doing it for people like Martin Luther King who had a dream that, that little boys and little girls would walk hand in hand to school in harmony and not hate one another, but love one another, right? There's a dream. And we believe in that dream that is America, that people could come from every nation and gather together in one place and live in, in harmony and unity and have peace among themselves. Do you, do you believe in that dream? People that come to America believe in that dream, that there's a place of prosperity and blessing where God has put his hand upon the people and there's no tyrannic rule upon the people. That's the dream that is America. God wants to rebuild this nation, but he needs people at a grassroots level that make themselves available to God. And when things get really tough, you got to remember your purpose. Now, some of you have heard rumors that, that there's been times that I've been known to do Iron Man, right? <clears throat> it's just a rumor, Oh, actually, Elisha, you've seen, he's seen me out there. He, he's been with me out there. He's seen it, right? That's right. I forgot. My wife's seen it too. But, but we do these things called Iron Man. And can I tell you, if you do an Iron Man, at some point, it gets really tough and really ugly, right? Maybe some of you have run, ran a marathon, right? They say when you get to mile 18, you hit the wall, right? Anybody with me? You know what I'm talking about, right? And, you know, but when you do an Ironman, you swim 2.4 miles, right? And then, and then you get on your bike and you ride a bike 112 miles. Then you start the marathon. By the way, how far is 112 miles? I guess it's probably like to Rehoboth and back, right? You ride your bike to Rehoboth and then back, right? Then you start running a marathon, right? And, and it's, it's not easy. So when, when you start running, and you get, usually it's a three-lap thing on the run, like eight-plus miles, because it's 26 miles. So you do the first lap, and you're like, just, you know, you're just so happy you get the first lap done, you're just so glad to be off the bike, right? Your tush is just all kind of sore, and you've been on that bike for about five and a half hours, right? You've been on your bicycle for five and a half hours, and you're just so glad to get off that bike, you're glad to start running right? And you start running. Then you get in the second lap and you go, why am I doing this? <laughs> and if you don't have that why figured out in your heart, when it gets really tough, you know what you do? You walk. You start walking. 
But if you have that why, if you know why, why am I doing this, then you keep running because there's a finish line and there's a goal and there's a dream and there's a reason why you're doing this. You know, it's not like you don't have anything else to do. There's got to be a why. Hey, when it gets tough, when you're in the middle of revitalizing, when you, when you determine to build and the enemies come in and there's opposition and warfare and you don't have enough of fill in the blank, you got to remember the why. Why are we doing this? We're doing it because there's a dream. There's a dream of our church. There is a dream for our people and our children and our grandchildren and the generations of people that will come after us. Can someone say amen? Christina, can you help me? Right? Amen? Right? Like there's a dream. When it gets tough, you got to know the why, right? You've got to have that burning conviction of what God wants to do and you must resolve it in your heart. Where does that come from? Well, that comes in that four months of praying and fasting. See, it's in that four-month time of praying and fasting that Nehemiah got that burning conviction in his heart. It was in the time of struggle, the time of consternation, the time of rumination when God was building power inside his heart. And he, he knew this is something we can't fail out. This is something that we must do. This is something that must happen. We can't go back. We can't stay here. We must go forward, right? And that conviction, that resolve was built into his heart in that time, you know? And the reality is anything that we do of significant eternal value, we must do together. And it's going to be a struggle. For us as a church, it's going to be a struggle. What kind of church do we want our church to be? What kind of church? Do, you know, naturally, we first think of ourselves. Well, what would I like? What, what is best for me? But God would have us lift up, his eye, lift up our eyes and look at the community around us and say, how has God positioned us right here, right now, at this time, how has God positioned us? And if you can see that, God will show you what you must do, right? We have a school, and not right now because of coronavirus, but eventually in the next three years, there will be 600 high school students in this building, right over there. We are uniquely positioned to be a blessing, to serve our community in that way. We have a university just two miles away that has 40,000 students. Not right now. Not right now. They're, you know, summer, you know, quarantine, whatever is going on. But not right now. But they are there that it will come back again. And this church will be uniquely positioned to reach students. But this is what happens when we unify on that vision. And it's no longer about me, but what God wants to do. See, the vision starts by looking up and then God causes us to look out, right? It must be upward and outward, not inward. Hello? Can you help me? Right? It's for a vision. When a, vi when a vision comes from God, it's because we look up. We're looking up to God and saying, God, what would you have me to do? Here I am, Lord. Send me. And it's no longer about me. It's about what does God want? And if, I, if you could just, you know, somehow like John was caught up into heaven, right? Revelation 4.1, he was caught up into heaven. And God showed him a vision. I, if you were caught up into heaven today and God just showed you his perspective of this community, I'll guarantee you his heart is for all those young people at that college. Oh, his heart is for you as well. But see, you already believe in him. You are people that, that love God and know his word, right? But now he wants to direct our focus to look up toward him, and then he would like to turn our eyes to look toward those students that will come in this school. 
those students who come to the University of Delaware, all the families from all different uh, ethnicities all around us, thus the vision that we have that God is calling us to be a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church that will reach the community in which we dwell. That's our struggle, right? That's our struggle. See, to think about that, to let God grab a hold of our hearts, turn our eyes up toward him, and then look out. For Nehemiah, it was, he went around the wall. He started walking around the wall and said, what needs to be revealed? He didn't talk to anybody. He was looking. He was watching. And at a certain point, he knew what he needed to do. Like that passage we talked about last week in 1 Chronicles 12, 32. You know, the, the children of Issachar, right, were, were men who had understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. Can you say amen? Right, they knew. They, you know, they knew what God wanted them to do, right? You, you need, you know, and the people were with them. The people had agreement. The people had buy-in. You say, well, I don't know what I could possibly do, Pastor. You expect me to go up to the university and pass out tracts and win young people to the Lord? They don't even want to talk to me. They rush right by me. And... No, maybe you can fast and pray. Maybe you can start praying right now from your home right? And, and by the time, see, 15 years, 15 years, Nehemiah, uh, Ezra taught the word of God before it really began to take shape in Nehemiah 8 through 10. See, we're not just talking about today. We're positioning ourselves for the future. And it's in this time of struggle that God turns our eyes off of ourselves to see the needs of the community around us and the people around us. And that's what we call in Philippians 2.12, I, I love this passage, gives people great struggle sometimes. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence also, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't just think of it theologically. Sometimes God is doing things in our heart. He's building resolve in our heart by really taking time and working that out through a process. Amen? Hey, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I hope this is grabbing a hold of your heart. And I hope it's something that you'll think of, not just today, not, in, not just this week, but maybe in six months or maybe in a year, you'll remember this day that this was a really important day. And we said, hey, come let us build. Hey, come let us revitalize Life Community Church. And the people said, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. We're in. And then Nehemiah could say, come on, let's go do it together. And we look and we say, but is it just going to be us? You know, a small group of people to do this? Oh, no, pray pray. God will send the people here. You'll see God bring people, more people for the music ministry, more people to help us establish the systems that we want to put in place, more people to evangelize, more people to lead, more people to, to teach God's word and build into us. You see, and even right now, I, I just want to be really honest and direct with you and ask for your prayers because even this week where we're working on things and, and we have somebody that we've already been speaking with and, and has been praying and is going to come and, and join our staff and help us in this revitalization process, okay? And I'm not going to tell you today, I'm going to make you think about it for a week and next week. We're going to announce the person that we're going to hire this week that's going to join our staff and be part and is going to help to lead us. And you are going to love this person. You might already love this person. Can you say amen, Pastor Boone? Is that, did I create any suspense? Gosh, you know, just tell us, Pastor. See, that's, that's how I am, Lydia. I just, I, I go buy my wife something for, for her birthday and then I'm like, Dennis the Menace, you know, I, it's like I want to tell her right now what I bought her. I, I can't wait until her birthday. I just have to tell her right now, but I'm not going to tell you. Okay, next Sunday, next Sunday, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be so excited. I, prom, I promise you, 
As soon as you hear this, your heart is going to be so excited. But not just that. We're also in a process right now to hire a pastor. We're going to bring another pastor here. And we're really excited. We've done a search, and we've been searching for three months, right? We had a, a, a consultant work on it, and he, he's, um, you know, searched all over the country, right, and garnered resumes and then given them an application, and we've gone through a whole process, and, and we have five candidates that have been turned over to us right? And, and we're really excited. There's some really good men that God, you know, has brought. And we're really praying to say, who is it that God has for us here at Life Community Church, right? And, and so I'm going to ask you, would you pray? Would you really pray to God and ask him? Because it's really important for us, right? Like right now, it's just myself on staff and precious Rebecca helps and, and a few people, Samantha and other people helping behind the scenes, right? But we just really have a very, very small staff. So we really need help. There's a lot that we try to do with just, just a little bit of help right now right? And so we need help. If we're going to revitalize, we have to staff our church. Amen? You know, if you have a, if you have a, you say, hey, we want to rebuild this wall. Hey, have a great day, Pastor Jeff. Get it done. We'll be back next week to check on your work. No, it's not possible, right? It's something we have to do. Help me out. Say that again. What? It's something we have to do together. And we're going to lift one another's arms up. We're going to pray for one another. And I pray for you, and you pray for me. But we need more help, and we need some good people here to help us to revitalize God's church. This is what we call this time that we're in right now. It's a time of struggle. It's a time of reflection, rumination waiting on God, anticipating what he's going to do next, take self-control, right? You're just like temperance. You're just like pulling back the reins. Like, I just wanna, you just want to go. Just want to do it today. I know what is right. I know the right thing to do, but I can't do it yet. Got to wait on God to do his part. Don't want to get ahead of him. I know I can't go back there. Can't stay here. Got to go forward. Come on, people. Let's go rebuild the walls. And the people said, let's go do it. Let us go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Let us go and revitalize the church, right? Here at Life Community, right? Other churches across our nation, we want to see God revitalize his church. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take struggle. But then we come together. And we watch God do what man cannot do. God does it. And that's the coolest thing. You hear me talk about it all the time. You see his fingerprints. You see God doing it. And you can look back and you say, this is what God did. And when it gets really tough, you already have the why figured out. You already know your purpose. When it gets really tough, you know the why you know the why. You've already, that happened in the time of struggle. It's at this time that we resolve why we must do this. It's not, it's not an option to fail. Amen? Lord God, today we commit this unto you and with all our heart, we've prepared, we preach, we believe this is the message that we, we extract from Nehemiah chapter two. It was a time of struggle. It was waiting. He knew in chapter one what he needed to do, but it was in his head. And the vision that it was in his head, he knew, right? He that knows to do what is right and does it not to him, it is sin. And for the people of God in Proverbs chapter 3 uh, and verse 27, uh, we, we simply know this, that uh, we can't withhold what is good when, from whom it is due, when it is in the power of our hand to do it. We must do the right thing. So Lord, move our hearts to do what is right, to lead this people forward and just to see your church revitalized. Give us the resolve. Work at the vision from our head to our heart. 
and give us a deep resolve and a deep conviction that this isn't just a good idea. It's something that we must do in Jesus' name. Lord, we commit this unto you. And though, though we are few in number in this room today, we know there are many more listening online. And if you're online, can you just send me a chat? Say, I, we resolve. We, we are one with this vision. We believe in this vision. I want to go back on the chat later and, and look at it and just, just see. I want to know that, that it's in the heart of the people that we have agreement that we, we can't go back, we don't want to go back, we can't stay here, we must go forward, we must rebuild, we must build the walls again. Lord, we commit this unto you, and I thank you, Lord, for just your work and what you're doing in our midst. We thank you for this lesson from Nehemiah chapter 2. Drive it deep into our heart, call us to fast, to pray, God, for our staff, for new staff, for a new pastor, Lord, just, we just ask your work right here in Jesus Christ's name. We praise your name, Jesus Christ, the Holy One. Jesus, we worship you. Lord, this is good news. This is exciting. We are excited to see your work done in Jesus' name. Hey, if there's anybody here today, if you've never called upon the name of Jesus Christ and You've never, you've never become a believer today. Would you share a prayer with me? Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Maybe you're online and you're listening today. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, I believe in you. I've been touched today. Something has bore witness to my spirit. I know that you are true. You are real. I've sensed you today. I want to give my life to you. Jesus, do a work in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. What a great message this morning. I'm uh, just going to say a word about uh, our tithes and our offerings here this morning. And obviously, you know, we're not passing through the aisles. The baskets are on the table. If you're in the room with us today, please feel free to worship the Lord by leaving your offering back there in those baskets. And for folks at home, obviously, you can give online and through Tithely. Uh, all those type of things so that the work can go on. But, uh, you know, this is really something up here, isn't it? There's, this, this is kind of a mess, <clears throat> you know, as it stands there right now. But uh, I, I, I promise I'm going to share a word about, about giving here. But I just wanted to read you something that I read in my devotions this week. Uh, it just really struck me. I think it was Wednesday morning. Uh, I don't often read stuff that other people have written other than what's in the Word, but I, I just really felt compelled to share this. And as I listen to the message here this morning, I just can't hardly believe how God just puts things together the way He puts things together. So this is just a little portion of, of what I read in my devotions on Wednesday morning. It says, if enough of us decide to get close enough to the front line, then we will have more impact. It's strength in numbers. And if our numbers are strong, then we can do something about the issues that seem impossible. Everybody was expected to participate in the rebuilding of Jerusalem's gates, and there were lots of people working who were not qualified or specialized. There were priests building alongside perfume makers and goldsmiths and district leaders. There were even fathers laboring with their daughters. Lots of people doing something that they were not experts at. They didn't pray about whether they should do it. They prayed while they were doing it. And they didn't just wait until they knew how. They learned as they went. Why? No. I want you to catch this. Is this talking about Nehemiah or is this talking about 2020? Why? Because the people were in danger. Evil was outside the gate. Children are at risk. God's reputation with an entire generation was on the line. There was too much at stake. Everybody necessary to rebuild the town was already in the town. And that principle is true for us. Our churches, communities, and families are full of the people necessary to help fix them. If we jump ahead a few chapters here to Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 39, 
It says the people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary and the ministering priests and the gatekeepers and the musicians are also kept. So if you have your, your oil or your grain or whatever it is, probably don't put it in those baskets back there. <clears throat> it's maybe not going to work so good. But if you brought something else, feel free to leave it in the basket or give it online. But that verse closes with this statement. It says, we will not neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect the house of our God. What a powerful and a far-reaching message. They were to participate. Another P word, Pastor. Not simply be spectators in the house of God, but to take action. And one way that we can participate is through our giving. I recently heard an interview with one of the producers up at Sight and Sound in Lancaster, and he said something that I feel applies very much to each one of us in a personal way. And he said this very simple statement. He said, God is inviting you to participate in what he's doing. Two words there. Inviting. God is inviting. And he's inviting us, inviting us to participate. God always does his part without fail. And then our part is to participate in our giving, in our service, in our prayer, in our fasting, in our service for him. So let's pray for this offering this morning. Father, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this great history lesson uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, the book of Nehemiah. And we ask us, Lord, that we not neglect the house of our God. And we know that house might be this physical room that we think we're in here today. Really, it's in our heart, it's in our life. That's where you dwell. We thank you for that. And we ask you to bless Life Community Church as we endeavor to go forward and rebuild. And uh, we just pray that your hand would be upon us, Lord. Help us to have generous and giving hearts as we go forward. In Jesus' name, together, amen.